I want to talk about my experience, uh, stuff I can back up. I have documentation. I have copies of the grants uh, where these things are described. And this is the one I got involved in at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, when initially some animal welfare people said this grant uh, in its introduction says that these experiments will help find a cure or a cause for Alzheimer disease. And we wonder, you being an Alzheimer expert, is that true? And so this is what they do to the macaques, the monkeys in this grant. And I'm told that similar stuff goes on at University of Wisconsin, but I know this goes on at University of California, San Francisco. So this is a grant looking at uh, smooth visual pursuit. So it's studying how we track moving objects, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm a neuroanatomist. I think that's cool. How do we track an object across our visual field? We can do it smoothly if we're following an object. But if we try to just move our eyes in that same arch, we do it herky-jerky. So that's interesting. How do you manage to uh, smoothly pursue a moving object? And it also studies the vestibulo-ocular reflex. And that's uh, the hookup between your inner ear and your eye muscles. And uh, in clinical practice, sometimes people get nystagmus, so their eyes beat in different directions. And sometimes, when, if you, not that it's ever happened to me, but if a cop pulls you over for a drunk test, he'll uh, have you follow his finger, and he's looking for nystagmus, because that's a manifestation of impaired vestibulo-ocular reflex. So it's all very interesting neurophysiology, no question about it. And it's actually valid science. But in order to study those things, this is what they do to these macaques. Uh, they put titanium plates and bone screws into their skulls so that they can put the monkey into a frame and he can't move his head. Because if you're going to measure his eye movement, you can't have the head moving around. And they put uh, eye coils into the sclera of the monkey's eyes. And they put a cylindrical recording chamber into the monkey's skull uh, so that they can put an electrode through the recording chamber and insert it into the monkey's brain so that they can measure the activity of individual neurons. And they implant similar chronic electrodes into the monkey's cerebellum so they can measure the activity of the flocculonodular lobe. And uh, they, they put uh, vision distorting spectacles on the monkey, and they have to wear them for 12 weeks. And uh, they put these cylinders actually in the monkey's skull bone. Uh, the mastoid process of the temporal bone is where your inner ear is. And that's where the vestibular apparatus is. And to study the vestibular ocular reflex, you have to know what the vestibular apparatus is doing. So you have to put a cylinder in there um, inside the bone. So that's a lot of manipulations. That's a lot of surgeries. Um, if they did it to me, I'd say I was being treated with cruelty. In fact, I would say I was being tortured. And you can ask yourselves whether this would amount to cruelty or torture or not. And then, <laughs> and this is, this is kind of the over the top uh, frosting on the cake, is uh, after all that's done to the monkey, the monkey, in order to get the data that the researchers need, has to voluntarily track a moving object. So they can record what's going on with the eyes, and what's going on in the cerebellum, and what's going on in the cerebrum, and what's going on in the vestibular apparatus. And that doesn't work unless the monkey has his head immobilized, and you can see what his eyes are doing. But the monkeys don't want to do that. The monkeys, be fair, are pretty pissed off. And I can understand them. So to get the monkeys to do it, they fluid deprive them so that they are dehydrated. And then they put a little hose in their mouth. So if the monkey tracks, does his trick, so that they can get their readings, he gets a sip of water. And I, I've read this grant, and I was just amazed, and I recoiled in horror from it. And I found out, and the monkeys can't even drink their fill on the weekend, because they have to be thirsty to get to work on Monday. And they describe this as fluid deprivation to provide a work ethic. A work ethic. Now, that's spinning for you. Nobody objects to a work ethic. But you might object to fluid deprivation. And then, and this is the point where they kind of lose me. Um, you might, I, I'm actually being very serious about this, but in, in general, I get in trouble for being very politically incorrect, and I make jokes all the time, and I get called to the dean's office for too much horsing around. I agree with Oscar Wilde that life is far too important to take seriously. Um, except I get serious about this primate vivisection stuff, and dog vivisection, and cat vivisection. But I wonder, are these guys trying to be funny? This is from the grant, and uh, this is a quote from the grant, is that collars can be hooked with a pole to allow us to escort the monkeys to a specially designed primate chair. And I'm thinking, are these guys like, like Snidely Whiplash or Simon Legree? Are they twirling their mustache and they're saying, we can escort them to a specially designed primate chair? I mean, that's not the image that comes to mind with escort services, you know? That's not what an escort service does. Oh, you'd have to pay plenty to get an escort service. They hook them up with collars and they drag them by poles. They're not escorting them to a specially designed primate chair. 
It's an especially designed chair in the same sense that the electric chair is specially designed. So when I read this, I wonder, are they kidding around? Or do they just want to use words in a very special way? It sounds much better to say we're escorting them to a specially designed chair than we're dragging them to be trussed up and have their heads bolted into a frame. And these are some pictures of these guys. So this is a picture a friend of mine took of Frick. And Frick is a macaque, and he's from the University of Utah. And he's in one of these experiments. And here's his collar that you can hook up with a pole. And here's his head with the bolts and the plates in it. And here's Frick in his cage. And, and it's my impression, it's my contention actually, that first impressions about cruelty to animals are very reliable. They're almost never wrong. When you see an animal and you think it is being treated with cruelty, there's almost never an explanation for, oh, I was wrong about that. I think first impressions are very valid. So here's the first impression. This is what they're doing to Frick to learn about smooth visual pursuit and the vestibulo-ocular reflex. And these are some pictures that friends of mine took uh, from Covance. And this is Covance in Vienna, Virginia. And Covance, I guess, is a major player in the primate vivisection world out here, too. So these are uh, other experiments that are going on at Covax, Covance. And it's kind of hard to see what's going on here. You say, well, what is this? This guy's got his gloves on, and he's on top of this cylinder, this tube. What's going on in that tube? Uh, you can't really see it too well. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a monkey in there. There's a primate in there. And he's in this uh, clear plastic cylinder with his arms pinned down like that to immobilize him so that they can do more research on him. And so ask yourself, if they slid you into a clear plastic tube and immobilized you, would you conclude you were being treated with cruelty? Or would you conclude that you were being tortured? And here's a monkey uh, at Covance. Again, he's stretched out on a rack. And here's something to age me. There's a, say, <laughs> look away from the gruesome picture, and, and, and I notice that there are some gray hairs in the audience along with my own gray beard. Oh, by the way, it's short term, I, 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 this is a tangent, but I noticed you have a lot of Lincoln stuff. Lincoln is a big hero of mine. And uh, Lincoln supposedly was sitting with his uh, attorney general, and the attorney general had a white beard like I did, and he had completely black hair. Um, and so somebody said, how come your hair is black and your beard is white? And Lincoln said, it's obvious. He talks more than he thinks. So I see some gray hair here. Obviously, I talk more than I think. But is there enough gray hair that anybody besides me remembers the Art Linkletter house party show? Art Linkletter was great. And he had a segment called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Kids Say the Darndest Things. And so it's been my experience, because I work at a research-intensive animal, a research-intensive university, that vivisectors say the darndest things. Uh, when I discuss these kinds of issues that I think this is, is wrong, an ethical judgment, uh, one of my, and he's a friend, as close as I can be to a friend with a vivisector. He said, no, the animals don't suffer that much. And I'm going, wow, what would it take before you say that much? I mean, with this kind of, why isn't this that much? And he dismisses it. And then I was watching a, a tape presentation from one of these sessions where uh, one of the faculty members uh, said one of the darndest things. He said that this is a sacrifice that we are willing to make to advance the health of our own species. And um, that reminded me, speaking of uh, old fuddy-duddy stuff, of uh, the old joke from Tonto and the Lone Ranger, where they're surrounded by Indians. And, and the Lone Ranger says, we are in a lot of trouble, Tonto. And Tonto goes, what do you mean, we, white man? So I mean, we are willing to make this sacrifice to improve the health of our own species. The guy on the table is not the vivisector. The guy standing up is the vivisector. The guy on the table is the one that's being sacrificed. And it's not even a sacrifice in the Old Testament sense of the word. In the Old Testament, you would give up, you would burn the fatted calf. You had an animal that mattered to you, an animal that you were going to eat or you were going to shear, and you gave it up to please God. You give up something that, value, that you value. Obviously, they don't value these monkeys, and they're not even their monkeys. They are our monkeys. We, we buy these monkeys. These are taxpayers' dollars for these monkeys. Now, so they're not even sacrificing their own animals. So that was a weird thing. This is a sacrifice we are willing to make to advance the health of our own species. And another one of the darndest things they said is when I was trying to end the dog labs, one of the physiology professors came to my office. And he said, Hanson, I don't see what your problem is. He goes, there, to me, there's just a thick black line between humans and animals. 
And I thought, well, what kind of physiologist are you? I mean, that's the strangest thing in the world for a physiologist to say. I mean, if evolution teaches us anything, if science teaches us anything, if biology teaches us anything, it's that there's no thick black line between humans and other animals. But the vivisectors, they really want to have it both ways. They want to say that there's this thick black line so we don't need to treat animals the way we would want to be treated. And we don't need to worry about their pain and their suffering and their fear and their terror because there's this thick black line. And then the anti-vivisectors will say, well, then, then there's no justification for doing this because you can't get valuable data to improve the health of your own species because the animals are so different from us. And they go, oh, no, they're close enough for that. They're similar enough to us that we get valuable data, but they're not similar enough that we have to treat them the way we would want to be treated. So it seems to me they kind of want to have it both ways. Vivisectors say the darndest things. And here's that poor monkey stretched out, not suffering that much, according to some of my friends. Oh, and that sacrifice thing is interesting, too, because, like I said, the people on my floor, and some of these guys are my friends. I, I'm not happy with what they're doing, but they don't vivisect. They, they just trans, they make transgenic mouse models, and then they kill them. But when they get ready to kill them, I hear them talking in the halls. They never say kill. They never say we're going to kill these mice. You've got to go down and kill these mice. It's always sack. We've got to sack, sack, sack. And so I asked them, well, why do you say sack? And they say, well, it's short for sacrifice. And I said, well, why do you say sacrifice? And they say, because we're sacrificing them for, and I said, well, you're sacrificing them for your interest. And that's not the way a sacrifice was supposed to go in the Old Testament. You're supposed to sacrifice something. Anyway, they want to use sacrifice. Um, because it, it's back to words again. Uh, they don't want to walk around saying kill, 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 even though that's what they're doing. So we, like, we, we use words to disguise the truth from ourselves, or so it seems to me. So, okay, um, the last picture before we go on to the next topic is this is a guy in one of those specially designed primate chairs. Sorry, he doesn't project very well, but here his feet are tied and his tail is tied and his chest is squashed in there. And I'm not sure which experiment they're doing on him because his head isn't bolted, so he might not be in one of these vestibulo, oculo, reflex, visual tracking. But if they were doing this to me, I'd think I was being treated with cruelty.